Good morning, friends. Thank you for joining me this morning. As we gather to reflect on God's words, to pray, and uh, humbly think about what he has to say to us today, uh, we have the privilege of starting the third book of the Psalms. Now, the third book of the Psalms is a book that's anchoring itself with Psalm 73, which is this profound and beautiful look at what does it mean to wait on the Lord, and what does it mean to search for the Lord, and what does it mean to be frustrated with the situation in the world around us, and even to envy the wicked. That's where the psalmist, in this case Aesop, who started the, uh, the first temple choir and wrote many of the psalms that we're going to be reading in book three, um, that's where he begins today. He begins by inviting us to ask really hard questions and to recognize that it's not a bad thing to ask hard questions, to say, how does the world work? Where is justice in a broken world? Uh, where is God? How can there be a God in a broken world? I think that these decisions, these questions that we ask are of vital importance, and we don't need to be scared of asking them. More to the point, we don't need to be scared when we meet other Christians or um, people who are seeking to know Christ who ask them. Because as we're going to see in Aesop's case and in this psalm, when we ask these questions, it begins a journey that draws us nearer to God. Uh, much worse than asking these questions is to not to care about it at all and just say, well, maybe or maybe not. But when we begin the journey of asking these questions, God begins to reveal himself to us in a true theophany, which is God, a revel God revealing himself to us moment. So if you've got a minute now, let's read this psalm together. Psalm 73, a psalm of Aesop. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their calloused hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely slept, swept away by terrors. As a dream when one's awakened, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you, and on earth has nothing I desire besides you? My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. So in this beautiful psalm, Aesop brings us to a place where we get to really see his heart. He lays it all on the table, doesn't he? He says, you know what? I followed God for so long, but in this moment I looked and I saw how it seems like those who have ignored God's commands have just prospered. And he's looking at specific wealthy people who have hurt others and risen to degrees of wealth where they can just uh, ignore the, the common frailties that face men. You know, they're, they're kind of like that farmer that Jesus describes, the one who had a, a momentous harvest. And then he said to himself, wow, well, you know what? I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and I'll just get wealthier and wealthier, and I'll never have to worry about anything. 
So in that way, Aesop really uh, is looking at people who are in that kind of situation. And then and in that moment, he says, and I, oh, I, oh, I envied them. And I was frustrated with all that they had and how it seemed like life was so much easier for them and how other people praised them because of their wealth. Aesop finds himself in a position where he sees their wickedness and he knows it for what it is, but the world just sees their success. And seeing their success, the world acclaims the success rather than condemning the wickedness. And Aesop's wrestling with it. And then finally in the psalm, the story is very simple. He says, I went into the temple and then... I saw how it all worked. I saw that this was just for a coming judgment, that you would bring an end to all of their wickedness, that there would come a day, a moment, when they would fall, when they would slip, and they would fall to their doom. And this, that line, I'm pretty sure, this is just coming out of my memory, but that line right there where he says, they, they, they will fall to their ruin, verse... Um, Surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by tears. That is the verse where uh, Jonathan Edwards got, the, uh, the Jonathan Edwards used when he wrote his famous uh, sermon, Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God, that started the, the, uh, the uh, second grade, first great awakening in the United States. So uh, you can Google that if you want. That was a huge thing in our history as was uh, the work of Jonathan Edwards in general. But what we have here is we have this realization that God is storing up everything for a moment of ruin and judgment. And this ruin of judgment will be fierce and it will be terrifying. It will be without restraint because he's allowed those who are wicked to continue in their wickedness. Um, he's in his kindness. He's invited them to repent over and over again. And they've they spurned him, and so when the when God's wrath comes, it will fall terribly. And when Jonathan Edwards preached this sermon to the uh, the early community there in uh, New England where he was preaching, there's that was exactly what happened: is the people saw the fear of of God's judgment coming, and more than that, they saw the holiness of the living God and the opportunity to repent. And they seized that opportunity, and there were people crying out and people weeping. And believe me, Jonathan Edwards was not the type of guy to be enthusiastic in his preaching at all. He just sat with a page like right here, and he read the page. So he, but the words that he had to say, and the Holy Spirit that spoke through him to his congregation, began a great awakening, an awakening like we have never seen since. Really, I mean, we've had the Second Great Awakening, but that was more like. That was a, a lot more emotionality with very little conversion and change. And uh, it's, I think that's there was nothing compared to the First Great Awakening. First one was better, if you ask me anyways. But that doesn't matter. What matters is today as we come to this psalm, we're invited into that same place. That place where we stand before God in the temple. And when we walk into the temple, there's another image that confronts us. It's the image of Jesus crucified. And we are reminded that what it cost our Savior to save us from our sins. And so these two images hold themselves in our minds. One is the, the power of God's wrath and God's judgment, and then the cost of grace. And we can either run towards the grace and humbly cry out, putting our hope in Christ, or we can, uh, hey, we can harden our hearts and ignore God's wrath, the same wrath that fell on Christ that will consume the wicked in the end. And so the psalmist says, but this is my hope. My hope is that one day this justice will come, that uh, I can trust in the Lord and that you will be merciful to me. But, and that's why he turns it around and he says at the very end, those who are far from you will perish. You will destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Friends, that's where we stand. Do not harden your heart before him. Humble yourself. Cry out to him. Bring your concerns, your cares, your fears, your confusions, and even your doubts to him. Because he cares for you. And he died for you. So as you go in today, 
as you uh, pick up your pencil, your pen, as you begin your work, wherever it is, as you have to love your kids and be patient with them, what are, what are challenges you face? Uh, there are going to be moments of anger, moments of confusion, moments of fear, and especially with the news today and the sadness that we see around us. But ultimately, there is the Lord in all of his beauty, and trusting in him is a life's journey to learn how to do. But today is just one good step in that journey. So take that step and take a moment and read this psalm again and pray and think about what it means to you. I hope that you have an absolutely blessed and beautiful day. But first, let's pray. Father, we praise you that you are the king of creation. And we praise you that you are righteous and that you are good. And that this is your plan and not our plan. Your uh, ways are higher than ours, Lord. And we can't even begin to conceive of the justice that you have laid out before us for all of humanity. And we pray that you, we would with humble hearts walk before you, that we would do our part to do justice, to love mercy, and to care for our neighbor as ourselves, to devote ourselves to worship to you. And as the psalmist says, as Aesop says here, Father, help us to proclaim your good deeds and your actions to all who will hear. And we pray, Lord, that as we proclaim your love in a hurting world, that the love of Christ would appear with all of its splendor, transfixing hearts and transforming lives. And we pray for those that we know and love. <coughs> Children, adults, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, and relatives who don't know you today or who are in the process of seeking to know you if they were raised in the church and have become doubting. Lord, uh, reveal to them your holiness, your power, and the beauty of Jesus, that they may fall in love with you and uh, know your mercy and your, your grace. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for joining me this morning. I hope that you have an absolutely gorgeous day. Bye-bye.